you are the creator of all things. All things belong to you. We are your servants. We are your slaves. We are your brothers, and we are your people. And you are our king and our God, our Lord, our Savior. Uh, Father, you're the one who justifies, the one who believes in Jesus. And when you justify us, you said we are very ungodly. And that's very true. Thank you for your kindnesses, and thank you for sending your Son and loving us enough to send your Son. Lord, we worship you. Thank you for this last year and all that you have accomplished and done. Lord, magnificent things, Father, from your hand. It is a privilege to be used by you in every way. And we thank you so very, very much. Lord, I pray that this day our hearts would be right, and if not, uh, you would set them right by the time we are completed here this morning. Lord, glorify yourself in the teaching throughout the building with the children and, um, and with our hearts. May we uh, do everything to your glory to give you the prominence, the weight, and the importance that belongs to you. In your name, amen. And the rest of us will be in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Looking at the Church of, of Smyrna, we introduced it last week. We're going to be there this week and, and uh, another week anyway. I, I'm trying to narrow this down to not spend too much time on, on each of the churches. But the Church of Smyrna is the Church of Myrrh. And literally, um, last week we did some, some slides so you could see on the overhead that the spelling of Myrrh and the spelling of Smyrna are identical. They're the same words, right? They're absolutely identical. And the way you get the myrrh, you go to this myrrh tree, it's like a thorn tree, and you bruise it or cut it, and out comes this resin. And you take this resin and you mix it with different, different things. But anyway, um, when you get ready to use it, the way, you, the way that you get the fragrance from the resin is you pound it. You beat it. Right? And it gives off this, this fragrance. Uh, and that was used in, in the anointing oil in the Old Testament. And when God looks at suffering of his people, when somebody is doing something for Christ... Uh, he calls that a sweet-smelling savor, and it's the word for that which is restful, a fragrance of rest. Okay, uh, and when we get to to the Church of Smyrna, this is these are the part of the Christian community that deals with suffering and with martyrdom uh, and those things. Now, in the first chapter, when he describes the tribulation, listen to this John to the seven churches. He says, "I'm your brother and your companion in the tribulation." He's writing to the seven churches in the tribulation. Now, some of that may be new to some of you, but these aren't my words. These are his. The seven churches which are in the tribulation. At Ephesus, this is the church that um, had a lot of ministry going on, but they weren't walking with the Lord, and he tells them to repent. Smyrna, they're going to be crushed. Some of them are going to be martyred. This is going on uh, to this very, very day. Pergamum, this is the church. We, Gamum is Gamus. We get our word marriage, Right? Polygamous, polygamy is, is multiple marriages here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and so it's either married around or literally thoroughly married as in attached. And this, is a, this church is married to the world and Satan's throne rules among these believers here. All right. Thyatira, this is the diseased church. I mean, if, if it's wrong, they're doing it. Absolutely. Uh, it's a horrible thing. Sardis means remnant or escaped ones. And this is the dead church, church where nobody there seems to know the Lord except if a handful of people. Uh, the message to Philadelphia, this is the church that is the church of brotherly love, the church with the open doors. And then Laodicea, this is the laity, our dikaios is the word for righteousness. The laity, our, our righteousness, this is the rich, powerful, self-righteous church. Okay. So we're talking seven churches who are, chapter 1, verse we just read verse 9, these are the churches that are going to be in, uh, in the tribulation. Now, when we talk about suffering in Christianity, Jesus Christ acknowledges that um, it's harder for some people to do certain things than it is for others, right? And, well, and like um, the example of the widow, remember the widow, she gave in, do you remember, she, rich men are throwing in great wealth and she throws in a couple of little copper coins like a half a penny. And Jesus pointed out how much she had given, Right? It, it, very incredible, right? Now, most of us would, would look at that and think it's not very much. I say most of us because it's true. We tend to think great givers are awesome. And that's not the case. It's not that how this works. 
right? And Jesus is looking at this uh, differently. And it is the same thing. If, if you serve Jesus Christ and you're suffering and it's difficult for you to do it, well, then your reward is greater because it's more difficult for you to do it. You have to pay a greater price to do it, to do, to do so. And this, we'll deal with that uh, uh, this morning, all right? But they're always going to be part of the church that is going to be being martyred. There's always going to be part of the church which is, which is suffering, uh, that, that is poor. And this is the church that is rich. Okay? By the way, when was the last time anybody said, do you know of a good church where people are really suffering and being killed and martyred? So uh, my family, that's where I want to go to church? When was the last time you heard that? How many of you want that? Do you want to be rich in heaven or don't you? No, you don't. I don't either. I look at those boys and think, you win. <laughs> Just going to take a seat and watch. Uh, kind of thing. Um, Job got a double portion. Why did Job get a double portion? Because of his great suffering, spirit, soul, and body. And he was a type of, of Jesus Christ and, and the suffering that's going to come. Nobody suffers greater and therefore nobody's going to be rewarded. Jesus Christ, Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, or... It's the word "ounting" for the joy, or instead of the joy set before him, he made a choice not to to embrace all of that his very person had to offer himself. But he he died for other people, and because he sacrificed more than anybody else, God has greatly exalted him more than anybody else. Okay, you and I have never faced what he has faced. No man ever has. No man ever ever will. Therefore, great is his reward, and great is his, is his name. Uh, the apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones, right, in the, in the kingdom, judging the tribes of Israel. But how, was it, how did their lives go? They're all martyred. They, you know, we're, Paul said, God has put us, the apostles, we're, we're last, we're clothed, we're clothed poorly, we suffer, we're hungry. Uh, that's the life that he gave them. Uh, so he's going to take care of them in the future and, and, and do those things. Um, so Jesus talks about your treasures and store up your treasures in heaven. Um, I think he's just, how do you do that if you're poor? Well, he's going to show us in, in, the, in this church, you be faithful unto death. I'm not going to get you out of it, and I'm not going to get out of your pain and get you out of your suffering, but you be faithful unto death. And you're going to be the only church that's rich. Ephesus is not rich in the kingdom. Pergamum isn't, Pergamum isn't rich. Thyatira certainly isn't rich, right? And the rich church here certainly isn't rich in the kingdom. But there's one church that is rich in the kingdom, and that's them. They pay a price. They don't have much. We don't know much about them as far as their theology because, uh, you know, that you've got to be careful here because Jesus, uh, you know, and the apostle did not. Uh, it talks about those who have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge, right? It's just pagan zeal. Uh, kind of thing. And you and I are not called to burn out for Jesus Christ. We're called to live for Jesus Christ. That's harder, don't you think? Don't I find. All right. Now, there's a part of the church that's going to do this. I, um, because this is broadcast, I'm not going to tell you the name, but our friend in Myanmar, Burma, uh, he sent a text to me this morning. He said, he talks about the two miners that were among these ten, uh, civilians that were abducted here. They're in civil war over there. As a, they were used it as a human shield, and they were brutally killed by Myanmar's junta army in the Qin state. Two of them, he says, are my close relatives. One's a father of six kids. They're hiding out in the jungle for life. Uh, please remember them in your prayers. For some of this, it, it, it's too late, right? Um, this stuff is, is, is going on. Um, when he talks, you know, I don't know how many warnings there are, but in Deuteronomy says be careful with wealth because it will, it'll make you cold, indifferent. It can, it, you, you, you begin to think your own hand has done all these great things for you. Your own hand gave you life and breath and the opportunities and things like that, but it hasn't. That's not how that, how that works. It never has been. Okay. Now, read with me chapter 2, verse 8. To the angelic messenger of the church assembly, which is in Myrrh, or Smyrna, those who are being crushed. The one who is the first and who is the last, who was dead and has come back to life, says this. Remember Jesus, he's talking to those who are going to die, and he, and he said, remember me, I died as well. That, um, the city of Smyrna, it dried and came back to, to life again. I know by, by watching your crushing tribulation. I know your poverty. Okay, and this is not the word for just poor. This is beggar. This comes from, by the way, the word for poverty here 
it comes from a word which means to crouch down with kind of a humility and fear, perhaps of being struck or something like that. He says, but you are rich. And I, I would think that those words um, would grant them great encouragement. You are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews. And they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan the slanderer. And do not fear what you are about to suffer. Now notice it hasn't happened, but it's going to, and it's going to, and it's right upon you. Behold, the devil who is a slanderer. Now, Satan is a Hebrew term in verse 9. Devil is a Greek word for Satan in, in verse 10. He's about to cast some of you into prison that you might be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. You be faithful unto what? You're going to die and I'm not going to get you out of it. You be faithful unto death and I'm going to give you the crown of life. The crown of life. Do you remember Stephen, the first martyr? His name is Stephanos. This word for crown. The victor's crown, the martyr's crown. I'll give you Stephen's crown. Nobody typically wants that. But it's a great crown. Verse 11. If you have ears that actually work, that actually hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. One who overcomes is not going to be hurt by the second death. That's the lake of fire. That's not going to be coming your, your way. Now, there's a great picture I, th I think of, of. I want to do two things here. Uh, in the Old Testament, you have, uh, at the temple, you have what's called a drink offering. Literally, it's a, it, the word drink isn't there. It's just a word for pouring. You pour, pour out. Um, but you have, you have two descriptions there. For the first and foremost, they point to Jesus Christ. But in the New Testament, he says, make your bodies a living sacrifice, right? Uh, talk about the sacrifice of praise, uh, things like that. So we take the sacrifices that Jesus did, and we, we can, after he's done that, and uh, he, he can apply those to you uh, as well. He died for others. You can, may have the opportunity to, to do that as, uh, as well. There's a great picture of, um, of Jesus and, and us, I think, by extension, when they took the flour, it's sifted twice, it's fine flour, and they take the oil and they put that in there and they knead that all together, right? Mix that all together. Once that's done, can you ever get the oil out of the flour again? How much of the flour has oil in it? Every bit of it. Because if it didn't have oil in every speck, what would happen when you shook it? The flour would come out because it, 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 there's no oil. But it, it is permeated with oil, okay? And when we talk about the temple and the oil that's used down at the temple, the Lord says in Zechariah, that's my spirit, right? And so you have, um, it's hard for us to, and we're so far removed from the Middle East and from the, that, that farming type cultural background. And most of the scriptures are written to more farming type analogies. Jesus do use farming tools, terminology all the time because people understood it. Less so in our day. When we think of food, we think of Walmart or Albertsons. <laughs> We don't think of fields, okay? Um, but bread, bread is a common term for food. Some translations will translate it food, and they're absolutely right because fish are called bread, okay? You get the idea? It's food, okay? But, um, and men are seen as bread, and because if, if you take the word lechem, which is bread, like Bethlehem, house of bread, and we'll, some, someone will say, but it can also be how, uh, house of war, because lechem means war. But it's true in what sense, because the sword eats one man as well as another. See it? Uh, so lechem is bread, and men are the bread. Right? You get the idea. All right, so it's used that way. And Jesus said, this bread is my body and broken for you, etc. And you take that and you take the Spirit of God and you put those things together and you have Jesus Christ. Okay? How much of God is in him? Oh, how much of humanity is in him? Yeah, can you have 200% of something? Apparently. Uh, apparently, yes, right? But they're one, aren't they? They're one and the same. And when Jesus comes to earth, born of, of a virgin, he comes in, he is fully oil and fully bread, right? He, he has those things, right? And so that is the ultimate expression of a spirit-filled man. How much of him is permeated? Uh, every bit of you. And so when he says, be filled with the spirit, what does full mean? Last time I checked, there's, there's no, no room left, right? There's nothing left in you that is not controlled and, and permeated by the spirit of God, right? Now, it's the same for, for you and I. And so you can break your life and give yourself away in that way. Now, 
But you've got a drink offering, and the drink offering would have wine. It's not allowed to be offered up with anything to do with sin. And wine in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, he said, God has given wine for the joy of the hearts of men. So wine is associated with, with joy. Okay? Now, what is, a, what is a drink offering? We have a perfect passage. Let me read this to you. This is 1 Chronicles 29. David blessed the Lord in the presence of the assembly. And he blessed the Lord, O Lord, God of uh, Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and all that is on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above everything. Both riches and honor come from you, for you are over all. In your hand are power and might. And your hand it is to make great, to give strength to all. And now we thank you, O God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer up willingly, for free will offerings, okay, for all things come from you, and that which is your own is what we have given you. So when, when I give an offering to God, what am I giving him? I'm giving him back some of his own stuff. Okay. Uh, how many of you had to give your kids some money so that they could buy a present for their dads? Okay, right? And so, and, right, and, and when the child gives the present to the father, who does the child say it's from? This is not from mom, this is from me, right? Where'd you get any cash? You're never, you've never given God anything until he gives you something to give, right? And that's what it is. That's what it is. Now, the word drink offering, there's something that God has given you that I think is the greatest treasure here, right? Not offering with any sins, okay? Mixed with wine. This is 2 Samuel 23. The th three of the 30 men, David's mighty men, and this is the three men that puts them in that category of being mighty men who stand out from the rest of the army, all right? They went down and they came about harvest time to David in the cave of Adullam, when the band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was at Bethlehem. This is where David was born and, and raised. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. This is infested with Philistines. This is not a good time to be heading to Bethlehem, who's at war with Israel. Then three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines. They're at war, and they go, they break, three guys jump on their horses, they break through this thing and fight their way through this, and they go to Bethlehem, which is infested with Philistines, and there's a well out there, and I can imagine the commander at Bethlehem saying, three guys are out there doing what? Getting a glass of water? The three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines. They drew water out from the well of Bethlehem. And that was by the gate, and they carried it back to David. And he would not drink of it. He poured it out as a drink offering to Yahweh. And he said, because far be it from me, O Yahweh, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men? See what the water represents? Their life, their blood, who have risked their souls. And that word souls key. And therefore he would not drink it. And these things the three mighty men of David did. Um, water is that which quenches your thirst. And the word for soul, the word soul actually trash, it translates like your passions and, and your joys and your meaning in life, the life that you're living and things like that. So the idea is understand what did those three men put on the line? Their, their souls, their passions, their hopes, their dreams. Are these men married? I'm guessing so, right? They're, what about their wives and kids? Are they willing to, uh, to risk it? They're willing to risk it, Right? Uh, and, and to do that. When Paul was getting ready to, to die, he saw that the courts in Rome were going against him. In this is 2 Timothy 4, he said, listen, I'm, I, my end has come. I've run the race. I'm going to get my crown soon. And uh, he said, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. There are things that I want, but I'm not going to get to do those, those things. 
And so the idea is, instead of quenching your own thirst, sometimes God calls upon certain people to give their lives away. And Jesus said, you're not going to... If you lose mother or father or son or daughter or houses or lands, remember, here on this earth, you're not going to lose. You're going to get many fold beyond that, both now and in the life to come. You're not going to lose, right? Treasures in heaven, not here, not here. Be careful about this, right? Treasures in heaven, not here. Let me tell you. These are the seven churches, he says, in the tribulation. And, and, and let me just read this. There's war in heaven. Michael and, and uh, the dragon are, are fighting. The seven-headed dragon because it's kind of the seven empires that have persecuted the, uh, the woman. Uh, and they overcame him, he says, because of the blood of the lamb. And he's come down, he's going to start killing men. And they've overcome him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. It doesn't say they didn't die. They did. But, right, they loved life. There's nothing wrong with that. Only a fool loves death. Jesus didn't come to take your life. He came to give you life, right? Uh, that sort of thing. They didn't love their life unto death. There's, there's a limit that they would that they would, they would set. For this reason, rejoice, all heavens, and you dwell upon them, because Satan is finally out of the spirit realm. He's knocked down to earth. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who, the one who gave birth to the male child. <coughs> The child who will rule all the nations. Now, two wings of a great eagle were given to that woman in order that she would fly into the wilderness to her place, and she was nourished for time, times and half a time, three and a half years, in the presence of the dragon or the serpent. And he poured out water like a river. This would be massive amounts of people after that woman, that he might cause her to be swept away in the flood. He's going to kill Israel again. Uh, by the way, you'll notice Israel has come back to the land only to be scattered one more time. And they will be scattered one more time. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and drank that river and the woman um, from the dragon as he poured out his mouth. Now, and then the dragon was enraged with that woman. He Now, she's out of his clutches. He can't get her. What's he going to do? So he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. These would be Gentiles. This would be uh, the, uh, these, these churches here. There's a great verse in, in chapter 13 that following this passage. He said, here's the patience of the saints. This will help you endure. He said, if God has destined you for the sword, you're going to the sword. If he's destined you for jail, you're going to jail. Right? And the time of persecution and, and martyrdom, um, it, it is a calling of God to give your life away, to put this life on hold and wait for the next one. Right? To join those rich church Christians. To join them. Right. By the way, you don't have to be poor to join them. People learned that in the persecutions of Rome. The Roman Empire gave you 10% of a man's estate if you told on him, and so they were confident they get the 90%, and uh, people were becoming rich, and Christians were having everything taken from them at that time. We'll, we'll deal with that here uh, at another time here. But again, Jesus said, you're not going to give up anything that you will not gain back. So we, we're talking about a rich, poor people here. And now notice two things. So, there are those who are suffering. And if you're suffering and, and getting about life, it's harder for you to do that because of your suffering. Okay? And those who are being martyred, and you think, wait a minute. Uh, people that are going to get martyred. Let me tell you who was martyred. Fathers, mothers, sons and daughters, and I mean children. And I think... This, these people were being put to the sword, burned, given to the animals, as the people just in the stadiums roared for joy to watch this, this craziness. Watch this craziness. Now, remember, we need to see it as the Lord sees it. We need to see it as the Lord sees it. If you have nothing in this world, you have everything you need to serve Jesus Christ. Nothing can stop you from that. You can be wealthy. Your investments can be can be made there, right? It's Laodicea that thought that they were rich and that they were just blessed like crazy. And Jesus said, you guys are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. You remember the old nursery rhyme, the, the emperor's new clothes? He ended up being naked in a parade and being a fool until some little boy yelled out, 
King's got no clothes. And he realized that he had been taken to the cleaners kind of thing. Years ago, uh, someone used the example that we live in a world where everybody's climbing the ladder of success and they get to the top and realize the ladder's leaning on the wrong wall. And they're not where they wanted to be. James says, has not God chosen the poor of this age who are rich in faith? They don't have anything, but they have their faith in God. And rich in faith is far more important than any amount of earthly, uh, earthly things here. Now, this is the only church that's rich, and they're in poverty. They're, they're, they're poor, right? You know, in the larger cities like, like Smyrna, the church was dealing with issues of the guilds, and these, the guilds were in, in force, and you could not work unless you were part of a guild, right? Um, these guilds were referenced in, in temples, and all their meetings were in temples, and there were things you had to participate in those temples. And if you did not participate, you, you're out of a job. Well, many of those Christians were out of, out of a job, and they, they could not work. Um, much like we're dealing right now. When it's like if these government jobs are telling you you can't work if you haven't had all your shots. And you realize some people have had five and six shots now. Not about you, but you're going to stick me with six needles? That is a little over the top there. I can't think. But same thing going on in those days. Also, Smyrna was an incredible patriotic place, right? Patriotism can be good or it can be bad. Uh, kind of thing. I, I love the United States. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I can't, I don't, I've seen the other countries. <laughs> I don't want to live there. Uh, it's, it's rough out there. Uh, and, and I'm thankful in, in spite of all the problems. I understand that. And I, and I would hope that the Mexicans love, the, love Mexico and the Canadians love Canada and the Russians love Russia. I'm, I'm really for them in, in that sense, right? Uh, however, um, they were pro-Rome, big time. There was a Roman army that was freezing to death, and they actually took an, uh, an offering up of all of their, their clothing and sent it to the Roman army. And they were just helping those people because they were really pro-Rome. Uh, <clears throat> well, they set this up, and they had these te temples, and, and you were required of them to do your patriotic duty, and that is you have to declare Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Kurias, and you have to go down and offer up an, uh, a pinch of incense in prayer to him. Well, they told the Christians they had to do that. And what do you think the Christians did? No, Caesar is not Lord. Not, not any sense in the sense that I'm going to pray to him or something like that. I'm not going to do it. Well, they didn't do it. <clears throat> now, what do uh, really patriotic people think about people that they perceive as traitors? You get the idea? Well, they refused to do this. So they're not only out of work, but they began to take them down to the arena and martyrdom was taking place. It came, at a, it came at a cost. Now, I've never been in a situation yet where that was required of me. Have you? Well, the Bible does not put me in the category of Smyrna. You know, for, for Jesus' sake, I have been spit on before. I can live with that. I can wipe it off. It's an insult. It's not really persecution. I had an old lady hit me with a cane one time because I was witnessing to her. Uh, same thing. She was just a little weakling, and so it really didn't hurt. Uh, kind of thing. But I thought, well, she probably doesn't want me witnessing to her. Uh, this is trivial stuff. This is trivial stuff compared to this. And there are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I share with you that our Pakistan brothers who... Uh, so this has been about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. Guy sends me a picture of his martyred dead pastor. And he said, yeah, he got, we were out witnessing last night and he got killed. We're going out again tonight. And I look at that and think, well, this guy's excited about this. <laughs> I can't think. Uh, you know, and it's fascinating when there are Christians that you can see in that kind of con context. They're so joyful. Uh, they are excited about uh, things of Jesus Christ. And, you know, suffering brings t the most amazing things. So, you know, you guys remember Idi Amin? Some of you don't know that name, but 
<clears throat> there was a time when there was mass murders and I saw live footage of bodies in a river. I've never seen a river full of bodies before. I mean, you almost couldn't see water. It all the bodies flowing down. It was a river of bodies. I've never seen anything like that in my life. It was incredible. It was shocking. Uh, it was sad. And uh, Idi Amin, we used to come in and he'd grab everybody's Bibles in the church, get his soldiers around there, and they would all urinate on the Bibles. They would put those people to death at, at will. But what they found was people would show up for church in masses and in droves. And as they did that, they found that they would teach, and the people, when the teaching was done, they refused to leave. They wanted more teaching, more teaching. Tell me what death is like. Tell me what life is like. And what happens when my kids die, right? Their focus wasn't upon the music. Can we have some red and blue lights and some fog on the stage? <laughs> Nobody cared. Get that out of here. We've got no time for your silliness. We do that in the United States. That's very United Statesy, isn't it? Where everything is money and wealth and you guys are ready. You were that one of those purpose-driven churches that told they, they went into a new new ministry of an older church and they wanted to breathe new life into it. So they asked all the old people of the church to leave. We don't want you here. You go away. We're gonna it's gonna be all contemporary. And I thought, if I was an elder there, I'd say, no, you're leaving. You get out. And take your purpose-driven nonsense with you. Because it's not to the glory of God. It's not to the glory of, of, of God. Because they're thinking size, and they're thinking on wealth, and we're going to have a party scene up, up front, and I think we've got to turn all that on. What would you do with no electricity? What would happen to our, our music services? There's no fog, there's no lights, there's no, and everybody can't hear the guitar back there. So the only thing you've got left to do is we're going to sing to the praises of the Lord. And this is as good as it gets, right? This is as good as it gets. But it's not very sweet. Yeah, the Bible calls that leaven. Things that get in the way and, and lead God's people off what is real, right? Again, God has chosen the poor of this age who are rich in faith. And that's what God is after. Now, this is incredibly important. Jesus says, I know your crushing tribulation. Philip says the word tribulation. It means crushing. Most people think of tribulation. They think of an, a time seven-year period. But it means to be crushed. It's the same word. Uh, when they translated the Old Testament in Genesis, they took the grapes uh, of Pharaoh and took his cup and they tribulated those grapes into the cup. They crushed them. That's what it is. It is the crushing of the blood of the grapes in, in the tribulation time when people are, are dying. And the term that it uses here is, I know because I've seen it. This is a different word from, uh, from Gnosko. This is the word oida. I know I've seen your tribulation. Right? And that is good news. Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. When I'm being crushed or you're being crushed or somebody in Pakistan is being crushed because it's illegal to be a Christian there. <coughs> well... Jesus is watching that. In this world, John 16, 33, Jesus said, you're going to have crushing tribulation. There's a promise. There's a promise. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 12. If you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. People will, will uh, come after you in that sense. There are lots of different levels from being spit on to being to having your life uh, uh, taken, taken from you. But this is the crushing of myrrh in a very unique group of Christians not all Christians are called to be martyrs. Some are. And it is a calling. If God has you destined for martyrdom, guess what? <laughs> You'll meet up with that that day. And the murder is crushed and it puts forth this fragrance and and God is, is pleased when he smells that. In the book of Acts, the apostles, they came forth rejoicing that they were considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ and to pay a price. First Peter 4, if you suffer as Christians, he said, you can rejoice. The Spirit of Christ and the glory is resting on you. What a thing. What a thing. Right? Matthew 5, blessed are you when men revile you. Say, all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be glad, he said, because, he said, because that's a great thing. That's what they did to the prophets before you. It puts you in tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, context. You know, the prophets, look at the prophets. Um, some of the prophets didn't want to go, to go. Moses didn't want to go. Jeremiah didn't want to go. Ezekiel didn't want to go. 
And God put them through tremendous suffering and trial and difficulty because, because they had an opportunity to be, to be close to him. And folks, I don't think it's possible to, to walk closely with God and not experience some of this. Thank God it's not 24 hours a day. He doesn't say how much you're going to suffer, but it just comes your, your way. Okay. God rewards the suffering of his people when it's for his purposes, for his glory, etc. And if you're pouring out your life and, uh, and, and suffering and struggling to get, get through, and uh, Jesus Christ says, I know what you're going through. I'm, you, you're going to be rewarded for that kind of thing. Um, you, uh, you know, you, you have the opportunity over the years to see um, people who it is, it is difficult for them to function, to get up in the morning, to, to serve their families, to be about a part, to go to work, to just function is very difficult. Okay, That's part of that suffering right there. No amount of money can fix it. They're just, they're, they're broken and they can't be fixed. Um, but this is, this is where God has, has them, some of you, and you can rejoice in, in whatever that is because your little two half pennies, like that widow at the temple, will be acknowledged by him. Now, he says he knows their poverty, kind of thing. During the tribulation, says a measure of wheat for a denarius. A denarius was a day laborer. Okay, measure of wheat, like a loaf of bread. You work all day long and you get a loaf of bread. That's poverty. That's poverty. By the way, if you take one loaf of bread home and try to feed your family with a loaf of bread for the day, yeah, that's, a, that's a real chore, isn't it? Now, notice that the word poor is pania, pania. But here he uses the word tokeia, okay? And it describes the crouching position, a lowly crouching position and cringing here. The persecutions of the Romans were beginning, and the Christians were considered heretics, and they were... Be People were turning them in, and getting their uh, their getting their money, getting their estates, part of their estates, and wiping people out financially. Here, Jesus knew what poverty was because he's given up more than anybody has ever given up. It, it is astounding to me that the Creator of the universe would would even come to Earth. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of, uh, son of man that you give a rip about us? Especially since sins entered into the world, we're kind of forfeit. Uh, all those things. Uh, and again, anyway, that, that's why it says that God has given him a name above every other name, right? And everybody's going to, every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Jehovah God, that he's Yahweh. Uh, they were taking up an offering for Jerusalem. Second Corinthians 8 he says, We want you to know, brothers, that by the grace of God that has been given among the churches at Macedonia, for in the severe test of affliction, their abundant joy. And their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity. A bunch of poor Christians got together and took a, a good-sized offering to send it, send it down there. A lot of pennies can add up. A lot of pennies can add up. I think. Because they gave account uh, to their means. And uh, as I can testify, beyond their means, they shouldn't have been able to, uh, to do that. Um, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as was expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then they gave, uh, by the will of God, they gave themselves to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus when he had started that he should complete among you this act of grace. It's like we're going to show up with a good-sized offering. This is really, really uh, absolutely amazing. Um, <clears throat> God can provide by many or by few. And the rich and the poor can stand side by side. And your color, your nationality, your, your gender, none of that stuff is impressive to God. Ever. Ever. It doesn't matter. Helping needy Christians in, in, in dire, uh, dire positions. Um, you walk with God right where you are. You're going to be great one, one day. I know that there are those who get little small pastorates on their way to a bigger pastorate. Uh, you get a little teaching position on your way to a big uh, teaching position. You're always supposed to be going higher and farther and bigger, uh, etc. Uh, I've had several offers to leave Whitestone for a bigger ministry uh, some, and far better pay uh, kind of thing. And I just thought, no, I, I think the Lord wants me here. Um, and it's not that. 
Ted, what was our missions offering last year? Almost $60,000. We gave $60,000 to offering. Praise God. To, into missions. Um, none of it stayed here. It just all, it all, all went. What can you do in a little place like Whitestone? A little place like, can any good thing come out of... <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, we must not evaluate things like that. And again, who's looking for... I want to take my family to a good God-fearing, suffering, pagan, martyrdom church. Well, you're probably not going to find one in the United States. I can point you to one. Why wouldn't you want to go to church there? Why? Of all the churches of those seven churches, how many of us would line up at Laodicea? The beamers are parked out front. Everything is spotless. Everything is awesome. Everything is awesome. Let me ask you something. How spotless is life? It's not real. If everything is spotless, everything is perfect, everything is awesome, that's not real life. It doesn't work that way. Um, we're, we're just people. And we need to make sure that we understand that, right? And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.10, he uses the same two words. He talks about being poor and making many rich in, in their poverty. The apostles, silver and gold have I none, said Peter, but in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. I don't have anything to give you, but I can give you that. And that, that message, the word of God, sets people free here. Description of himself and the, these others, right? You know, church history is fascinating uh, on uh, several accounts. But one, one is church history is it's fascinating because, one, it's a mess. It's like reading through the Old Testament where Israel is a mess. The church has been a mess for a very long time, just like the seven churches, right? Uh, right? We want a New Testament church. Well, Corinth? Colossi with their, their fleshly visions. Uh, what kind of a New Testament church do you want? Usually the, the letters are written to those churches because they're a mess and he's straighten them, trying to straighten them out and he's not sure if they're going to repent. But, but the thing that really stuck in my mind is, is that the missionaries that have gone forth and taken the gospel forth, you would think, oh, these guys, these guys are not well financially settled. They just go. And in the 1800s was when the big missionary blitz took place. It came, uh, came out of uh, England and Wales and, uh, and, the, and particularly those countries, other countries as well, but really came out of, out of those. This is a, it was a crazy amount, percentage of those men who died getting to the mission field or the diseases at, right after they got to the mission field. And they won the day just by the sheer masses of people that were sent. And they went forth and they took that name, right? And they, those guys would go there. We have doctors and nurses on the mission field starving to death on the mission field and they are out there they're poorly clothed some of their children died there from malnutrition and, and the diseases that were there some of the missionaries were trying to get their kids back to back to Europe and they died on the way back and understand that's myrrh that's Smyrna they went forth there was a great cost uh, to, to what they did and, you know, these medical doctors, they would treat people during the day and they would read Bible stories at night so everybody in the hospital, their little hospitals could hear the Bible stories. And people began to come to the name of Jesus Christ. Um, I remember reading a biography of a gal who had gone to China. And this was, it was a crazy story about how she got there. I'm, I, I would have read the first, if I started read only the first few chapters, I thought, it's not God's will for you to go. You should not go. <laughs> but she, she went, and by the missionary couple she was going to go serve with, uh, by the time she got there, the old lady's husband died. And so they've got these two ladies uh, here, and they don't know what to do. So they're going to set up a station, a traveling station, off one of those trails. Uh, and they're going to have the, the cleanest little um, enclosed area where they have these trains with donkeys come through there 50 and 100 donkeys and, and the people running them <coughs> and they would pull, pull into there and they said we're going to have the cleanest little stay area and we're going to have hot good food and we're going to and the, in the evenings when there everybody was calmed down they would read bible stories to the people and that's how the gospel was going going for, uh, forth and uh, matter, matter of fact it was really crazy because they, when they first opened their doors nobody knew who they were and they wouldn't go in there and they went up to this train of 50 or 100 donkeys going through there and these two gals jumped out there grabbed the lead donkeys and steered them right in and all those chinamen jumped down the cliffs and the rocky hills because they're scared they'd never seen anybody white before and they said, they'll be back. We have their donkeys. <laughs> and it was difficult, and it was hard, 
and God used them. And there's a cost to, to serving Jesus Christ. There always has been. There always will be. I will not give to the Lord that which cost me nothing, David said. All right? People were at the Temple Mount when David went up there was a threshing floor before that. It's, that's the very same place that says that Abraham offered up Isaac. Right? And, and there was a threshing floor of or, or none, I believe his name. And he said, I'll just give it to you, sir. And he said, no, I, I can't give to God that which cost me nothing. I'll, I'll purchase it at the full price here. Missionaries have paid this, uh, the price. Had they not done that, the gospel would still be sitting back in Israel. But somebody pays the price. When you read the book of Acts, when the gospel went forth, what was it like? Was it a cakewalk? What was it? It was very difficult. It was difficult. Very difficult. When I am weak, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians, God who comforts the depressed. What a great line. God who comforts the depressed. Comforted us with the coming of Titus. How did God comfort their depressed? He said, we, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Things weren't going well at all. Uh, and all of a sudden, Titus shows up and begins to encourage them. And they just took that as from, from the Lord. But now notice, he takes this poor suffering church. <clears throat> Jesus said, I know it. I've seen your poverty. I know what it's like. I know you're being crushed. I know it. I can see the blood coming out of you. Okay, I know that's happening. But let me, he says, let me tell you a little secret. You're, you're rich. You're the richest thing out there. You're, you're wealthy. All right? And because you're, you're being faithful to Jesus Christ, he says, you're faithful in your tribulations, and some of you are going to be faithful uh, unto death. I'm going to give you a crown, a very unique crown, that nobody else in the kingdom will be wearing but you. You are rich. Not earthly speaking here. Things collapse. Wealth comes and wealth goes. But they can line up with Jesus Christ, who was poor as well, and allow God to take care of things for them. Now, he says, I know the blasphemy coming out of those who are saying that they themselves are Jews and are not. Okay? I know that's they're blasphemers. Okay. He's going to talk about Satan and the devil. He's and how he's going to slander. He's going to it literally means slander. That's what it means. It means to slander. He's going to put you in prison, and this is how he's going to do it. He's going to badmouth you. Remember, Satan has desired to sift you guys. Remember that. How is he going to do that? Well, he's going to slander you, malign your character. That's what they did with Jesus Christ, right? Jesus, you're born of fornication. You're just a bastard child. What a thing to say publicly. Roman father, nobody knows who he, who he is. We know, we know what you did. Others were saying, have you heard about the Jesus guy? This guy's demonic. He's got a demon. Uh, and, and on and on. Nazareth, look where he was born. Look where he went to school. See it? And Jesus said, if they did that to me, what are they going to do to you as my servants? Now, the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews. There are Christians today that still believe that every Jew is a lucky rabbit's foot, and all you have to do is rub him. Okay? That he's got something special that nobody else has. Is that true? No. That is not true. Not true. They said, we're Abraham's offspring. And Jesus said, no, your dad, I think, is Satan. What did Jesus say? Your, Abraham's not your dad. That's not how it works. Romans 2. You're not Jewish just because of the blood running in your veins. Right? John 1. To, you must be born again, but not by blood. Your, your Jewish blood or Gentile blood means nothing as far as getting the kingdom. Does a Jewish man have to be born again? Yes, he does, just like everybody else. Is he in his sins? Yes, he is, just like everybody else. And Paul said in Romans, not all Israelites are Israelites. They're not, right? Abraham had... Had a couple of boys, didn't he? He had Isaac, who else? Ishmael and about six others. Because he remarried after Sarah. Sarah had a bunch of more boys, right? But there's only one that was the chosen one, and that was Isaac, right? So being Abraham's seed doesn't mean anything. You had to be the elect seed, which is that one who was born again, as it, as it were, right? Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Well, He's, he's got Abraham's blood in his vein. Abraham's our dad. Well, Esau can say the same thing. Right? 
And Paul in Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, Romans 9, verses 6 through 8, uh, Romans 11, verse 5, 7 to, uh, uh, to 10, 14 to 15, 20 to 23, verse 25, all these things. My notes said read them. We're not going to read them because it just takes up too much time. Right? But they're just as lost as every, everybody else. Right? You know, you can rejoice in breeding heritage titles. People have done that. People in the church have done that. Right? <clears throat> Jesus told the scribes, he, he told his apostles about the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. What a group of hypocrites, he says. You scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and he, like seven or eight times in a row. You hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. And he did so publicly. And that's where they were. He told his apostles, he said, these guys, they, they want to wear robes to, because they want to be seen. They dress to be seen, which is a sin for anybody to do that. You or me. They want to be, do that. They have these phylacteries, things that they, had, they had wear on their hands and up, up here, and they had these little boxes with scripture uh, in their head, which is, I don't think, what the Lord meant. Jesus didn't wear them. The apostles did not wear them. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so he said, they make these things great big ones. Okay. Like a guy wearing a great big cross, right? By the way, just a reminder, if you, if you give my wife and I a gift, don't give us crosses and stuff like that. We think that's junk and I don't, we don't like it. We don't display it. We don't wear it. Kind of thing. Give me a latest Star Wars movie or something. <laughs> something useful. Yeah. Right. He says, they want to be called rabbi. He said, but don't you be called rabbi. They want to be greeted. And Jesus said, don't you do that. You be the greeter. You understand? They're not servants, but, but you need to be the servants. Don't do that. You can be called master rabbi, the anointed one. Uh, today, that's a big title out there. N not in the Bible, it's not. Okay, Pope, cardinal, priest, the reverend. Reverend, that's a big term. I think. The old King James used that term one time. It was used of God, so that's quite the title to claim. All right. You can wear the clothing to, ma to match, etc. Zechariah talks about those who are dressing to deceive. They were false prophets. They wear the, the garb. It goes on to this very, very day. Okay. And uh, do, do you remember, when you read through Genesis, we have a couple of uh, passages, and we read through Samuel. And uh, who's out doing the shepherding? How old is David. He's a boy, okay? Do you remember um, Jacob flees from his brother and he comes up there and I've got all these kids and these teenagers sitting there at the water thing. He said, what are you guys doing here? It's not time to water. There's good, good feeding time for the sheep. Why aren't you out feeding the sheep? Because they're a bunch of teenagers, you understand? Shepherds. How much education did they have to become shepherds? It's not a high <laughs> degree position. As a matter of fact, he says the, the, to, to the Pharaoh and the Egyptians are not going to like the fact that we're shepherds, so they separated and put them in Goshen because they despise shepherds. All right? And yet when you come to the New Testament, what's God's term for his teachers? Shepherds. It's a very lowly term. It's not a great magnificent strut and pride term. It's just not. That's not how that works. They're considered to be low people, no pedigree, no degree from a university, uh, etc. Okay? And that Ephesians 2 says that wall that separated Jew and Gentile, that wall's gone. They're, they're in there together now. We stand side by, by side. Okay? Now he says they're the synagogue of Satan. Now, <clears throat> Here's the thing. Um, there are good, good men, bad men in every society, earthly, earthly speaking here. So uh, there are good men, bad men of every color, every race, gender, uh, 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 etc. So uh, when we read through the book of Acts, <clears throat> the early persecutions were by Jews against Jews. So the Jews were killing the Jews, right? Um, Stephen is, was Jewish and he was killed by the Jewish people. James and John were being beaten and by, at the instigation by the Romans at the instigation of the Jewish people. When Stephen died, by the way, there was a unique guy sitting, standing right there with him, Apostle Paul. Okay? Apostle Paul, he had letters. He says he would grab men, beat them, and drag them out. Right? 
And he would also do the same with the women. I can picture the Apostle Paul grabbing a woman by the hair and pulling her out of, that, out of those synagogues. And later on, he was so ashamed of himself. He said, the great chief of sinners is me. I can't believe what I've done. I can't believe what I did. And I can't undo it. But he, but he did those things. And he was part of this, this satanic synagogue thing, as it were. And here you've got a situation where you've got a synagogue in the community creating a ruckus against these Gentiles, perhaps getting part of their, their money and, and their funds, slandering and allowing Lucifer to, to use that. All right. Psalm 105, verse 16 through 18 in the Greek Septuagint speaks of the synagogue of bitterness. People that rebel against God because of their bitterness, yeah, etc. You know, <clears throat> next week we're going to deal with the term Satan and how, th how that's used. You'll be surprised at what, what, how that's used. The word Satan appears a lot of times in the Old Testament, but uh, it's translated slanderer, right? But there, there are several texts where, um, if you're familiar with Zechariah, Zechariah says, He showed me Yeshua, the high priest standing before Yahweh, and the angel... Of, uh, the angel of the Lord is going to be the high priest there, the angel of the Lord, uh, Christophany, picture of Jesus Christ. It says, and Satan was at his right hand to Satan him, to accuse him. The accuser is at his right hand to accuse him, but literally the Hebrew just says that Satan was there and he was Sataning him. Okay? There was a text when, <coughs> when Solomon, Solomon was a type and a picture of the son of David as Messiah. When he comes that God will uh, will do things uniquely that he's never done before or ever will, will, will again. So Solomon is David's boy, and the kingdom was a type of the, what's coming with Jesus Christ. And Solomon said, I will build the temple because there is no Satan. Right? During the reign of Jesus Christ, mirrored by the reign of Solomon, right, where is Satan? He's bound and he's in the bottom. There is no Satan. He's not there. I think that text was prophetic, right? Because the word slander or accuser doesn't quite seem to fit there, by the, by the way. Um, politics has not changed. You create ruckus in nations and in situations by using politics and slander. It goes on today. You can see it going on in our, in our own house, in our own Senate today. And it's, it's a horrible situation um, that we can't prosecute those men for what they're doing, but, but we can't. We'll leave that, uh, that to the Lord. But all through the Old Testament, when Jesus comes and deals with, with Balaam, who is trafficking in the occult, it says that, that the angel of the Lord met him as a Satan. You want the occult? I'll show you what it's like. So either he meets him as one, or he's going to turn that loose on him uh, as well. In the Psalms, several times, it will, it will say, May God raise up a Satan at his right hand. Hmm, right? A sinning brother in 1 Corinthians 5, deliver one to, to Satan, right? A sinning brother is to be removed from the assembly, delivered over to Satan. If this is the life that he wants, let him have it. But he can't have it here among the, the, the body of Christ, right? Let Satan have his way, he says, for the destruction of his fleshly desires, that his spirit might be fixed, right? He, interesting. He can't be fixed here. He's living in sin. Remove him. Let Satan have his way until, until he fixes him. Let's, we'll deal with that tomorrow. But you're going to find that a lot of these persecutions that, that happen, they happen because Satan is lying and he is slandering. Um, if you want to be a deacon, it says, uh, the young ladies, and let them first be proven. It says she cannot be a she-devil. And it uses a word for uh, diabolos in a feminine form. She can't be a slandering, malicious demon. Right? Uh, she can't, and by that, I think he just means that he, she can't allow herself to be used that way. Remember Satan and, and these unclean spirits, the word unclean means filthy, dirty, right? And they deal with your, your thought world. And you, you'll, you know what it's like when ideas or thoughts come into your mind. And you, they're not from you, but they're him having his way and tempting you, etc. It's very subtle because that's the only place he can do, you know. Uh, Satan has never twi twisted your thumb back and go, oh, ow, ow, Satan's got me. That's never happened, right? But he can bring up your past and he can bring up all kinds of accusations against you and accuse you. And so you're, you're feeling bad because you're being accused. That's what it is. You're feeling the brunt of that. That's what he does. But he uses politicians as we'll see that. Does Satan ever, ever use the Apostle Peter? 
Yeah, you betcha. Does he work through politicians? Yes. He moved David to number of the people. Remember the numbering of the people? Remember the priests number the people, not the king. The priests number the people according to clean and unclean. So we can see that. He's working through Haman, the wicked, Mr. 666 himself, before we're in the Antichrist. <clears throat> he moves people just like that, tempting, moving them around, things like that. You will feel the brunt of that. You will feel the brunt of that. James says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Once come white fighting and warring with you, this is just fleshly lust, and he loves that area. Uh, if he can get you to go that way, he tells you that God is a liar. When he shows up in Genesis, God's a liar, you won't die, and everything will be fine. You can, you can live the life you want to live, and there are no consequences. It doesn't work that way. He's not telling the truth. He never is telling the truth. Jesus said he is a liar from the beginning, and he's a murderer. He, he can't murder you, so he's got to lie to you to kill you that way. All right? But it's not always you you're dealing with. It will be him. Um, I, when, when Satan is going to sift the apostles, and, and the word Satan means slanderer, um, accuser, that's what's going to happen. And all through the book of Acts, they get falsely accused. You see it? It's all satanic, isn't it? False accusations uh, against those things. You know, <clears throat> one thing I, I can encourage you, if you ever want to go into ministry, you'll be accused of everything that's possible to be accused of, even if you don't know about it. Sometimes when somebody's upset and they ask you about something, you just have to say, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but if you'll show me, I'll <laughs> take a look, because uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, those type of things. That just comes with the turf. You can't control what people are going to do. You can't control that. You resist him, he will flee. Uh, remember, that when, when you're dealing with um, accusations, true accusations or false ac accusations, it doesn't matter. Remember, that may not be you. It may be him. All right. Be aware of him and, uh, because he fun functions in the spirit. Remember, you think with your spirit. The the you know, spirit of your mind, the spirit of your understanding. You get the idea? That's where it is. And, and you, if you'll do that, you'll know where he's, where he's at. Okay? And one, one other thing, we'll close with this. Um, you, you are going to have seasons of, of, of struggle and suffering. And you can only suffer in, in body, in soul, or spirit. Your spirit's the suffering in your mind mentally, which is exhausting, isn't it? Depression. Right? Uh, guilt. Uh, those things you can't undo. Okay? But that's why Jesus died. Right? Physical suffering. Some people live, live and die in wheelchairs. Right? Quadriplegics. Uh, physical suffering. But your emotions, uh, as far as your soul, deals with your passions. Right? Your, the life that you're living in, the passions. Right? And that's the emotions. Right? And um, people that try and live on an emotional plane, a soulish plane, are exhausted all the time because you can't live there. <laughs> All right, and all that, all that emotion and stuff like that. So, it can be be any one of those three, or any combination of them, or all of them, right? But Jesus Christ has seen, and He knows when you bleed. He He understands this. He understands when you're dealing with depression and, and when life is just run over you like an eighteen wheeler fully loaded, right? And and overweight, and and it's hard to function at times. Um, you know, uh, people lose kids. They uh, divorces take place. Um, economies collapse. Economics, you lose everything. Um, you know, you see that around you, and God forbid that it should happen to you. But but for some of us, it will. It's not the end of the world. Jesus Christ is right there with you, and like He told them, be faithful unto death. I'm not going to get you out of it. You're going to suffer. This is part of the part of the program here. But in that suffering, you can become rich in glory, serve Him faithfully, and you will receive a great, great reward, right? If you have two boys, one of them is mentally very, very slow, and the other one is in fit health, right? And both boys are told to go clean, clean their room. This boy walks in there and whips through the whole thing in 10 minutes. Bed's made, everything's picked up, and everything else. This boy walks very difficultly into the other room, and he's in there for an hour and walks back out. <clears throat> okay, uh, You understand <clears throat> this boy may be treated a little bit more special because of the price that he paid. Okay, It's a little more difficult. At the very least, he'll get the same uh, reward that you gave the other. 
um, like there was people that uh, that labored early in the day, late in the day, uh, etc. <clears throat> Jesus Christ knows the price that's paid by you, and he knows the price that's paid by others. Um, <clears throat> at this point in time in my life, uh, I am so for God giving that which is good and just and right because he knows what he's doing, and he knows what, what reward you will receive, and you need to receive the reward as he sees fit. Okay, that kind of thing. And if you walk with the Lord and you are faithful, you cannot possibly enter into the kingdom of God poor. Right? That's not possible. Jesus Christ is walking and living and breathing among you and inside of you. And he is bearing fruit inside of you. And the only people in the Bible that is ever told they're going to get in trouble there too. One is the Corinthians because they were living so worldly. Right? The philosophies of the age. And he says there's no investment by God in those things. You will never reap a harvest from those things. They will, you'll lose everything. And then in Second John, he said, don't lose the reward that you've gained by, list, by tolerating and actually helping false teachers on, on their way because of some misguided being nice. That's not the way to do that. Let's not lose our reward. We'll have that uh, uh, one day. We'll have that one day. Father, thank you for our time together. We worship you. Lord, thank you for the gift of your grace of suffering, as Philippians calls it, the grace of suffering. We thank you for the trials and tribulations that come our way. Lord, uh, from everything from, from just trying to get by and, and raise a family, uh, financial setbacks, health and our health setback. Lord, emotional struggle from slander and, and, and lies that are about our character uh, or, or whatever it is, it, it, spirit, soul, or body. <clears throat> In those times of crushing, we kind of joined the church at, at uh, Smyrna, at Myrrh, and the fragrance that you smell is wonderful when we turn the cheek as you, you do and we do those things that honor you. You say we're blessed when men do that to us, so for so they did the prophets. May we not be fearful of these things, but rather have you strengthen us, walk with us, encourage us, Lord, as you see fit. For your glory and honor and your magnificence. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.